and I'd like to thank the organizer for inviting me today for this talk. Today, I'll talk about MLIR, but beyond the core infrastructure that we implemented in the LLVM project, I'd like to push forward a vision for the next decade around the need for agility in compiler development and the potential we have to build a strong ecosystem around the MLIR infrastructure in the LLVM project. I'm glad to have the opportunity to look a bit more into HPC today. I haven't attended this supercomputing conference for at least five years, but HPC is still close to my heart. Before working on compilers, I was actually a sysadmin, and in particular, I worked at a, at a HPC center for a university. And in order to prepare for this talk, I wanted to refresh myself on the state of the art of HPC environments. And I looked up some definition of HPC. The first one describes it as the use of parallel processing for running advanced application programs efficiently, reliably, and fast. This is my favorite one, as it is fairly general to include a lot of application space, including at the edge, in embedded environment, or even in everyone's pocket with your smartphone. Looking up on Wikipedia, it's a bit more old school there, and high performance computing redirects directly to supercomputer. So let's look at the typical HPC setup. In general, you're going to start with a machine with nowadays many CPU cores. The amount or the configuration may vary. For instance, a single node in the current fastest supercomputer, the Japanese system Fugaku, has a single ARM CPU with 48 cores and 32 gigabytes of HBM. The former champion, IBM Summit, has two 28-core Power 9 and 512 gigabytes of DDR memory. An important change in the last decade is that the use of hardware accelerators is now common, mostly because general-purpose GPUs are ubiquitous. For Summit, it accounts for six GPUs per node and 96 gigabytes of HBM. But at this point, let's have a look at the commonly available programming abstraction. So multi-core can be targeted by a various variety of APIs. A common one in HPC may be OpenMP. The programmer is given control over C, C++, Fortran programs mostly with directive expressed as pragmas instructing the compiler transformations, which themselves are fairly limited. The control is still in the hands of the programmer. For GPUs, the de facto programming model is CUDA. I personally transitioned from sysadmin to full-time full software engineer in parallel computing when the astrophysics labs got a grant and acquired some NVIDIA G80s in early 2007. And I had to set up CUDA 0.8 and learn how to use these new GPUs. That was a fantastic experience. OpenCL came up lately as the Kronos counterparts to CUDA intended to be more widely available across a variety of hardware. But it's likely not taking advantage of the most recent feature features available in NVIDIA GPUs uh, the way CUDA does. And both of these solutions leaves fairly little room to the compiler in practice. Everything like the power is still in the hand of the programmers. Uh, SQL is a more recent chrono standard and can be seen as taking advantage of modern C++ features to provide a higher level programming model for something like OpenCL. Intel is particularly involved with it, and SQL is present under the Intel One API. It remains a very C++ language extension where the role of the compiler is fairly limited again. OpenACC is a directive-based approach like OpenMP. However, it makes different trade-offs, and the programmer use of the directives to instruct the compiler is more about the properties of the program. For instance, so this loop is parallel. Uh, here are the buffers that is consumed and produced by this region of code. And ultimately, it will let more responsibility to the compiler to transform the program and map it to an accelerator, for instance. 
So we cannot be exhaustive here, uh, but there are also many library-based approach that are popular. Um, Silk, thread building block, more recently Cocos, or even the C++ standard. Since C++ 17, the standard library includes um, parallel primitives. And all of the solution have limited compiler involvement though. They are still really putting the control in the hands of the programmer. So this was all about a single node, and that's already a lot to play with. But surely there is a limit to what you can do here. And that's why you may want to scale this up and include many, many nodes. So now that you have scaled up the machine, you also need some network, possibly something like InfiniBand, which is super fast and fancy, includes some features like remote DMA, but you won't get far without storage. Probably you need a lot of storage globally accessible from the nodes. And uh, now that you have storage and you have many nodes, your program needs to go through the network to talk to each other. Your memory system is distributed. And so that becomes much more challenging. The big fish in this domain is still MPI. This is kind of the assembly language of distributed computing somehow is still heavily used directly. Some alternatives may be GasNet and Charm++, or at a higher level, the Legion runtime. These are all library approaches, and GasNet is used as a target by other higher level projects, either languages or frameworks. One of them is Chapel, uh, Chapel, I guess. This is the last one of the PIGAS that is still actively developed. This is also my favorite, but I'm biased. I discovered Chapel with a full day tutorial in 2009 from Brad Chamberlain himself. I found it so much amazing, the kind of productivity boost a compiler can bring that I actually left my job manually writing OpenMP, CUDA and MPI, and I started a PhD on compilers. A more standard approach may be nowadays CoArray Co Fortran, which is in the standard, but I'm a bit less familiar with it. And unfortunately, I didn't find any equivalent to Chapel that would um, abstract away the complexity of a cluster, um, a heterogeneous cluster like, like we commonly find in HPC. I also looked up into DSLs. Uh, DSL seems like the perfect solution. It allows scientists to express their problem in a programming model that captures the essence of their mental model. And the compiler can optimize it at a high level and then apply various strategies to map it to the target system. I suspect that DSLs unfortunately require a very large investment as one not only need to design a solution tailored to a specific domain, understand the exact needs of the scientist, but they also need then to build the entire tool chain all the way down to MPI or GasNet and CUDA. So the barrier to entry is really too large. There are no abstraction that you can really compose and reuse while writing your DSL compiler. And so we're coming a bit to the thesis behind this presentation. When using software libraries, you can compose and reuse uh, software components. Inside the compiler though, the compiler abstractions aren't as easy to compose. And so I'll come back to this multiple times along this presentation. So finally, I also looked up in the accelerator domain and it seems like the GPUs have been so powerful and so widely applicable that we aren't seeing any domain specific accelerators for HPC. Uh, I haven't found any other reference since the gravity pipe, which is an accelerator for gravitational model uh, developed in Japan. All right. Um, so I've also been wondering what is the LLVM project and the LLVM community providing in the space? And so it seems that we have a good solution for CPUs. LLVM IR is now the common language here. It has been very successful as the compiler abstraction for targeting single core CPUs. Um, LVM has support for OpenMP and OpenCL in Clang. 
but these are mainly supported as language feature exposed to the programmer. Um, the OpenMP IR builder have been refactored out of Clang into LLVM for the purpose of sharing these with Flang and MLIR. Uh, but this is still fairly limited in terms of reusing compiler abstractions. Clang also supports CUDA. Unfortunately, the LLVM IR, when you use it to target GPU, it only models the stream of execution of a single GPU thread. And uh, it's still a bit um, um, fragile in the way we model it. And there's a lot of work in the LLVM community to imp improve this. But fundamentally, it's still going to be a fairly low level abstraction. And finally, of course, uh, the community is very involved with libc++ in the C++ standard. And uh, that's where um, we're likely going to see involvement with respect to the new parallel primitives. And so it seems that as a community, there is still a very large space for the compiler to be present and to bring better solutions. And so we believe that MLIR is the way for the LLVM project to start building and offering the kind of reusable abstractions that are needed for assembling a compiler in such a complex space. So let's take a step back and let's contrast the traditional HPC environments with what is happening in deep learning. So to begin with, uh, for some serious learning, you need compute, a lot of compute. And so you're probably going to have a very similar configuration to your HPC cluster. Nodes with a lot of cores, GPUs. And then to connect these, you need a super fast network, including InfiniBand. And because deep learning requires a lot of data to train the network, um, you probably need a very fast storage backend to keep all of your compute nodes busy with all the data to process. And so all in all, we have a very similar system. There's going to be some differences, but there will be minor. And something that I found very interesting is that deep learning is a much more recent field. It really exploded in the last five years. And so it doesn't have the baggage that is associated with the HPC software does not have the millions of lines of Fortran libraries to carry over and support. So to some extent, we can look at deep learning to get some insights into how we may develop programming models and compilers for HPC setup if we started over from scratch today. In this domain, it's all about DSLs. So the big players from the last five years are MXNet, TensorFlow, and PyTorch. But there is a myriad of other frameworks out there for deep learning. A common theme, though, is to meet the scientists where they are. And I mean by that, that is mostly data science language like Python or Julia. There is virtually no one who would target uh, heterogeneous clusters like the one here with directly C++, Fortran, or MPI in order to train or deploy machine learning models. Another trend is the development of custom accelerators. Large companies like Intel and Google are present in this field, of course, but there is also a large number of startups in the field. So let's look a bit more into how deep learning training work. And I'll zoom a bit into how Google TPUs are set up. That's the one I'm the most familiar with. Um, and how the compiler in particular is a very centerpiece to how we scale deep learning with uh, clusters of TPUs. All right, so if you want to do some um, deep learning, you need first a task to learn, and prefer preferably something really useful. So in general, this involves um, picture of cats, and we need a lot of them to train our model. So uh, that's going to increase my view count for my presentation, apparently, including some picture of cats. Now that we have uh, some data set to train, we can run the forward pass of our model. So we feed it images, and it will compute a prediction. For instance, like, does this image contain a cat? 
In general, the prediction will be very incorrect at the beginning. The model will give you the percent chance that there is a cat in the in the picture, and it may just say 50% all the time because it doesn't know. And so you need an external source of truth, for instance, manual labeling of an initial set of pictures. And from this, we compute a loss. We tell the model how much incorrect the prediction was. And then we process with the backward pass, which actually take this loss, the, how much incorrect we are, and back propagate this error through the layers of the model and adjust all the coefficient of the computation. So this is a very simplistic description, just so that we can follow along if you're not familiar with how deep learning works. And this representation is a bit incorrect. Even in theory, we are not supposed to process images one at a time, but somehow all at once, because some parts of the algorithm needs to normalize the signal for the world data sets. Now in practice, it's not really uh, practical. And so we performed what we call batched training. Um, so when you do batch training, the process consists in some sort of vectorizing the loop. And we compute the forward pass with multiple images at once. And then we get the truth and we compute the loss on every sample, every images in the batch. And we, for simplicity, let's say we average them. And that gives us, again, the gradient. Uh, um, for the current batch, and then we can just backward uh, apply the backward path the backward pass again and update all of our coefficients. Um, so uh, the size of the batch uh, really depends on the actual model and some um, specificity of the the system we're training. And so this is something that the experts on the model will, will decide on. It's one of the hyper parameter that will be mostly using trial and error, uh, testing which one works the best. Because as you can see, it's not semantic preserving. If you change the N here, the size of your vectorization, you change the actual uh, numerical properties of, of the computation. And that may help uh, your model to converge better. So this is all good now, but how do we scale this to tens or hundreds of nodes? So this is the multi-batch process. Um, we're actually gonna use, again, n images per iteration, but times n nodes. So we differentiate the mini batch, which is the set of images processed by each node, and uh, the total batch, which is what all the nodes process together. So what we include extra in this process is that when we compute the loss, we have to average across all nodes. So we insert communication with this all reduce in the middle before applying the backward pass. And so after we do the all reduce, all the nodes are in sync. So the blue part is when they diverge and the all reduce keep them in sync again. They have the same gradients and when they apply the same gradients, they keep the same weight everywhere. So this is called synchronous training because they always keep applying the same weight on their own mini batch. Uh, we're not gonna get into asynchronous training today and we'll focus on the synchronous training and we show how do we map this to a distributed cluster in practice using Google TPUs. All right, so what are TPUs? Uh, TPUs stands for Tensor Processing Units. They are publicly available on Google Cloud uh, in their second and third generation version. A single tray in a machine has four chip or eight cores and 128 gigabytes of HPM. And that provides you already 420 teraflops. And that's not even counting the CPU cores that will be in the host. TPUs can then be assembled in what we call a pod with uh, 1,024 chips, so 2,048 core, uh, connected together with a dedicated interconnect network that is joining the TPUs in a 2D torus topology. There is no host that will be involved in the communications. The TPUs themselves form a single cluster that is entirely autonomous. 
And uh, more recently, Google published how, man, how multiple pods can be chained together and showed result scaling up to four pods with over 400 petaflop available. So you have to keep in mind though that TPUs operates at peak on BFLOT16 format, but that's are still very, very impressive number. If we really compare this to uh, the top 500 list, which is from last year, um, you can really see how TPU are somehow there. Uh, even though they operate on BFLOT16, it's difficult to account for. Um, but even if you multiply uh, the performance of Sierra by four, um, assuming that these numbers are for double precision, um, you still cannot get the performance of, of TPUs. So uh, this is the list from last year, but that's also a TPU v3. And just recently, uh, Google showed the performance of the new generation TPU v4 uh, during a submission to MLPerf. So MLPerf is uh, both a benchmark suite, uh, like spec, uh, but also um, competition in which academics and industry are invited to submit their best score at training some models. And you can see some very impressive improvements just over a year with the new generation of TPU. So this is a very exciting field that is moving very fast. And it's not only moving this big data center field, it's also moving at the edge. Um, Google has also a solution here, but many other players are in the field, including Intel. Um, and our edge TPU allows you to, again, perform some very efficient, uh, this time inference oriented prediction uh, on your smartphone or your embedded device. And so this is a very exciting field with a lot of innovation. Um, and I think the compiler is again, has a very strong role to play uh, in the field. So uh, let's talk about the tensor processing units. Uh, deep learning involves a lot of linear algebra. And in particular, it stresses the need for optimizing matrix multiplication. So without any surprise, a TPU core includes uh, 128 times 128 matrix multiply units with a totally not revolutionary design since it borrows the systolic arrays concept from the 70s. And the TPU also have an independent vector and scalar units and it's very powerful, but it's also very difficult to program at a low level. It has many constraints around how memory transfer to scratch pad needs to be scheduled, the padding and the alignments, uh, the VLIW packing, etc. What's interesting is that from the beginning, the chosen path to address the programmatic, the, the programming challenges associated with TPU has been to rely on the compiler. And so it, TPU only exposes a very high level programming model for the TPU. And it relies on the XLA compiler to get the performance and the scaling. So XLA stands for Accelerated Linear Algebra, and it's the only way to target TPU. The programming model exposed relies on operators manipulating tensors. So multidimensional array that are assembled in a mostly pure data flow graph. Uh, I'm saying mostly pure because XLA has also communication primitives to communicate across devices. And the operators are in general linear algebra operators, but also with many of them that we inherited for uh, better optimizing what we commonly find in deep learning models. So a design principle in XLA is to keep the operators uh, semantic orthogonal to each other and so that they compose well with each other. A limitation of the XLA IR, HLO, is that every tensor has to be entirely statically shaped. This may seem overly restrictive, but this is also what simplifies the compiler and provides the ability to perform a lot of necessary optimizations for TPU. 
in particularly in particular um, layout optimizations to account for the padding and alignment constraints. Ultimately, the entire program is operating on a statically laid out memory um, and there is no dynamic memory allocation involved in executing a program that has been compiled with Excel. Um, and so because Excel is fundamentally a compiler technology, the operators are fused during cogen. So even though in the data flow graph, a sequence of element-wise operation would appear as if there is a temporary array that is materialized between each operator, the Excel cogen will fuse them and emit only a single scan of the memory and eliminate all temporary, array, temporary arrays. Um, the Excel cogen can also make use of libraries. For example, in particular when targeting GPUs, XLA will use uh, CUDNN primitives when appropriate. And similarly on CPU, when you use XLA, the compiler will decide when to use Agen or MKL primitives um, when appropriate. XLA has some other competitors in this field uh, that are a bit more recent, like Glow and TVM. But I believe XLA has some unique feature and I'd like to get a bit into it. In particular, when it comes to scaling to multiple devices, Excel can model graphs that have multiple devices. Nodes in the graph, which are operators, can be annotated with which devices they should be mapped. And so if we give a graph to Excel that targets two TPUs, Excel can automatically partition it, insert the right communications, and those communication primitives will then be lowered to the right um, primitives for the platform. Uh, for instance, on NVIDIA, it may involve nickel. On TPU system, it's going to involve another DMS solution. And this technique can also reduce the memory limit for the model by splitting it across two devices, making use of more HBM available. And this is all implemented in the compiler. Another very interesting um, compiler support for scaling is special partitioning. So partitioning relies on annotation that are given by the user on the input and only the input. So for example, an existing model can make use of special partitioning with just a few lines of config. Here you can see in ten the TensorFlow API, we express that we're gonna use four cores of TPU for this model. And we also express that we, how we want to partition the input. So for instance, the two and two here will uh, indicates that the input images have to be partitioned in four quadrants, like you can see on the, on the right hand side. And so the compiler is then responsible to manage the partitioning of the graph. It's gonna manage the propagation of those um, the split that is on the input across the world graph, it's going to partition the graph and insert all the communication of the hollows or the, any redundant communication as needed. So this technique can improve the performance, but it can also increase the amount of HBM memory available for the model. What's really powerful is that it doesn't require any change to the model itself. It's only some annotation that the user will put on the input, it's a separate configuration, and then, then all the transformation is automated by the compiler. The compiler can decide what's best depending if you want to target TPUs or GPUs, for instance. All right, I have another very interesting optimization that uh, enables a lot of performance out of our systems that can showcase uh, the role of the compiler in those uh, very demanding environments. This optimization is called weight update sharding. Each node processes different data and compute the local gradients, which are then averaged across all nodes before being backpropagated on each node. So what you have to note here is that after we averaged all the gradients, the computation that will backpropagate the gradient and update the weight locally is identical and replicated on every node. 
This can be a large part of the process. The backpropagation can be up to 45% on some of the models that we care a lot about. XLA can recognize this situation and automatically shard the backpropagation to eliminate the redundancy, including adding the extra communication. So instead of averaging the gradient so that every node has the entire copy, the nodes with, will only get the average for a shard of the gradients. For instance, here with two nodes, each of the nodes which get, will get the average for half of the gradients. And they will use their, their um, shard of the gradients to update half of the weight. Then after the weights has been updated, they will exchange the weights they updated so that again, they are in sync and we can move to the next iteration of the loop with the weight being the same on each of the nodes. That way we dramatically um, reduce the amount of computation that has to be done by each node, providing double digit increase uh, in percentage uh, speed up. So despite the extra communication, this also can save some memory uh, in, in the model. It all depends on the actual optimizer used and the actual model. So um, here are some references if you are interested in getting more in depth into this topic. Um, but I hope that I showcase some very advanced compiler optimization that requires some co-design and that, um, that, that really uh, I feel are missing in HPC systems. And so um, I'd like to mention also a rising star in the domain of deep learning framework, and that is JAX. This is a project coming out of Google research. It started as a thin wrapper on top of XLA and adding some autograd on it. And then they built a lot of layers that are very nicely thin and composable. So if you want to play with XLA capabilities without the complexity and the layers that come with a more large comprehensive project like TensorFlow, JAX is a very elegant solution. And so a key point that we can get from those uh, compiler transformation is that this is what allow machine learning scientists to stay in Python, Julia, Swift, or any high level language and they will never have to see any Fortran or MPI. And optimization like weight update charting are not for everyone to be implemented manually either. They require a lot of effort. They, need, they will need to be re-implemented almost for every model or for every optimizer if the models were implemented in Fortran. So yet, uh, despite those user being writing high level Language, they make efficient use of supercomputers. So can this be a future for HPC in general? What kind of compiler capabilities do we need to build to get there to the point where this is the way to go? And so I'm going to transition to talk about MLIR and why it can be a game changer for the LLVM community. So LLVM managed to achieve the hourglass model, providing a unified target for CPU. However, modern languages also redefine their own IR. For example, optimizing the Swift ref counting is much easier at the SIL level, where you can capture the high-level semantic. And similarly, Rust borrow checker would be difficult to implement in LLVM. And Rust has its own IR, MIR, that enables this. Many frameworks in the machine learning world are targeting LLVM. They are effectively defining higher level IR in the tensor domain and lowering to LLVM for CPUs and GPUs. This is structurally the same thing as any other language frontend. So zooming on the TensorFlow ecosystem, at the very top, the arrow is showing the XLA path that we talked about extensively. However, TensorFlow supports many other systems most of them are fairly similar conceptually, and all these arrows are complicated and convoluted bridges that try to integrate this project together. And this glue rarely lead to a good user experience. They are fragile, rarely complete, and hard to maintain. In general, 
there is a poor reuse and a lot of redundancy across all these projects. So MLIR at its core is a generic infrastructure for representing and transforming code. It provides a framework to create an IR and manipulate it. The project is heavily inspired by the LLVM infrastructure and engineering practices in general. Since MLIR allows to create new IRs, it also provides facilities for multiple IRs to cohabitate together. And it provides a framework for converting one IR to another or to a mix of others, allowing to really lower progressively across the abstractions. So the idea is that this capability can be leveraged to easily add new abstractions. This provides an incentive to compiler engineers to favor a very progressive lowering of the abstraction level, which is convenient in terms of design and testing of the compiler components, but will also maximize the reuse of those components. This approach has been successful so far and convinced enough partners in the industry that the best place for MLIR governance and ensuring a good collaboration was to be inside the LLVM project. And so that's why MLIR integrated LLVM less than a year ago and is thriving there. Let's see quickly what is under the hood and explore the basic principles of MLIR. MLIR core concepts are fairly simple. The IR is organized around three main data structure. Region is a list of basic block chained through their terminators to form a CFG. A block is a sequential list of operation. One difference with LLVM is that we're not gonna use fee nodes, but we're gonna use block arguments like the Swift seal IR. And finally, the cornerstone of MLIR is the operation. It's a generic single unit of code. And so the important part to remember is that there aren't really much more hard-coded structure or operations in MLIR. Even the top-level module or the definition of functions are just modeled as any other operation. And it's gonna probably become more clear with some examples. All right, um, so everything is about operation. We call those the operation instead of instruction in LLVM to distinguish from this fixed list of instruction. You don't have an enum giving you the list of operation in MLIR. You cannot also define your own class, members, and storage like every LLVM instruction. There is one opaque C++ class that defines the storage and the members in a generic way for any possible operation. An operation can be representing anything. It can be perform a matrix multiplication or launch a remote RPC task on a worker. It can also directly carry an entire loop nest or any other kind of nested regions. And we'll show some, we will show some examples of this later. But let's start with the anatomy of an operation. What you see on the screen um, with a lot of colors is the generic assembly format of MLIR. This is just like the LLVM textual output, except that any MLIR operation can be represented with this format. This is really convenient. It makes serialization and deserialization really simple and mechanical. So what are the elements um, that can define an operation. There is an isomorphic relation between the in-memory representation of an operation and this generic format. So let me walk you through this. First, what uniquely identify an operation is its name. You have the operation ID prefixed by the dialect name. Together, this provides a unique name for an operation. An operation produces SSA results. An LLVM instruction produces only one SSA value at most. In MLIR, there can be multiple results. This operation, for example, defines two SSA values as a result. 
In the textual IR here, we use a single name for the SSA value and an index to differentiate the two value. So in parentheses after the operation name, you have the list of operands. Um, the operands is a comma separated list of SSA value. You can see the name of the SSA value that we refer to, but also an, op an optional index. This index indicates here that we're gonna use the fourth result of the operation that has been producing the percent input. After the list of operands, we have um, the dictionary of attributes. And so attributes are extra operands that may be optional sometimes or mandatory. Uh, they are named. And one constraint is that those are constant literal in the IR. They cannot refer to SSA values. So on the second line is the type of the operation. We're using a functional notation. After the column, you have the types of the operand in parentheses, an arrow, and the type of, res of the results. Um, so after the bang, you have the name of the dialect that define this type. And then between angle brackets, you have the serialization of the type, which is opaque to MLIR and specific to the dialect. Uh, and finally, on the last line is the location for the operation. They are often elided uh, from debug printing, but always present in memory. Locations are rich. Here we can represent that it corresponds to a particular call site of a function at a given place in the source code. All right, this is what an operation is made for, made of, and something to keep in mind is that when you define an operation in MLIR, you can really, uh, you cannot add any more state or storage. You have to fit in this structure. Um, the only thing that you define is actually putting restrictions uh, by saying, will this operation return a result? Will it return multiple results? Uh, what are the restrictions for this operation and the kind of types that it can process? What attributes are loaded or required? There's actually one more thing that is held by operation. So let's look at regions. So this is a very important properties of operation. They can hold a list of regions. The concept of a region does not have any equivalent in LLVM IR. The best analogy is to look at LLVM functions. These are first class structure in LLVM and they hold a body in the form of a CFG. The CFG is a control flow graph, which is actually a chained list of basic block. In MLIR, everything is an operation. Even a function is an operation. Because operation may have optionally one or multiple region attached, and the region is nothing else than a list of blocks which may represent a CFG, this is how functions are modeled in MLIR. An operation uh, with a region that models the body of the function. Since a region is a list of basic blocks, and basic blocks themselves are just a list of operations, the structure is recursive. The nesting is just infinite. And this is a whole new dimension in the IR, which opens up a lot of design possibilities. Regions are very commonly used in MLIR and very powerful to express the structure that uh, is frequently associated with the kind of problem we model in MLIR. And we'll come back to this with multiple examples. Anyway, with this simple structure, you should be able to understand almost everything in MLIR. So one more thing is that you will hear a lot about dialects. And dialects in the MLIR ecosystem is a bit like a C++ library. It is at minima a namespace where you can group a set of types, a set of operations that will operate on these types or types defined by other dialects, and a set of custom attributes. So just like a C++ library, when you define classes and methods, the dialect is your own IR library. 
By defining this set of types attribute operations, you can define a closed set that has a well-defined semantic that you can manipulate. A dialect is loaded inside the MLIR context, and it extends MLIR using various hooks and interfaces. Like, for example, the IR verifier. It will enforce invariant on the IR, just like the LLVM verifier will check that transformation don't break LLVM IR invariant. Dialects are cheap abstractions. You create one like you create a new C++ library. There are already roughly 20 dialects that come bundled with MLIR, but many more have been defined by MLIR users. Our internal users inside Google have already defined over 60 dialects so far. Something else that is important to know before looking at examples of MLIR is that the IR doesn't always look like the generic format we've seen previously. And this is because dialect authors can customize the printer and the parser of operations and type just to make the IR more readable. Dialect IRs can be seen more like DSLs. You may need to read the documentation to be able to interpret them correctly. But you can always disable the custom printer and parser. There is no semantic difference, and you can have the generic print of the IR always available. Let me show you an example. This is showing the nice syntax and some advanced semantic modeling at the same time using region in the affine dialect. So the affine dialect is modeling polyhedral loop nest and a bit more. And we see that here you have a function with nested loop and inside the innermost loop, you have a conditional with some sort of linear equation describing the condition. This is important for polyhedral tools because it ensures that the loop nest can be analyzed and transformed within a mathematical framework for correctness. So what we have here is actually uh, a find dot for operation. And we have a nice syntax that make it look like a for loop, but this is just hiding the generic printer. It will actually uh, model this as attributes and it will uh, define a new region with a single basic block for the body. And inside this region, we have a new block with a single operation, which is another loop. And again, it will define a new nested region and in this region, there will be a single block with a single operation, which is this affine F. And the F can have two regions, one for the true branch, one for the else branch. In this case, there is only code in the true branch, so we don't show the else branch. And uh, that makes it very readable, like a DSL. But you have to keep in mind that in memory, you're always going to have the generic uh, form. And you can always actually print it. And that's how this example would print with the generic form. And you can find here the outer for, the inner for, and the if. And you can see how they are nested by uh, uh, creating a region here and a single basic block inside the region. Uh, this i0 here uh, corresponds to the k that was in the, in the pretty IR. Um, and we see the lower bound, the upper bound, they're referring to symbols that I'm not showing here. They, they will be shown at the beginning of the print. And so that really shows you that if you fit this actual generic IR, MLIR will by default print the one that is at the top using the dialect custom printer and parser. Um, but in the end, the generic uh, representation is really what you manipulate in memory. So it's good to always keep in mind this structure. Another example of a dialect with a custom printer is the LLVM IR itself. Indeed, the LLVM IR can be modeled as a dialect, and it is actually implemented in MLIR. So you will find the LLVM instructions, the LLVM type, they're all prefixed with uh, LLVM dot um, to model the dialect namespace. It's not feature complete. There are things like inline assembly, block addresses that are hard to model but it defines enough of LLVM to support the common needs of DSL-oriented cogen. There are also some minor deviation from LLVM IR, for example, because of MLIR structure, constants are not special and are instead modeled as regular operations. For more details on the MLIR infrastructure, feel free to look up the website for documentation 
and in particular the toy tutorial which can walk you through a practical example. All right, um, so that was the basic of MLI infrastructure, but while the infrastructure alone is already a boost to get started writing a compiler, I think a large part of the value proposal here is the vision that we have for the ecosystem that we can grow around MLIR. In this section, I'd like to bring back the parallel between how software development is agile, you can reuse other people's libraries and compose them, and how this is missing in compiler design. The idea is that MLR Daleks may be getting us closer to have this capability for IR design. In particular, the, for heterogeneous compiler design, where the paradigm are various and we cannot come with a single IR like LLVM achieved on CPU, we need to be more agile and we need to have the flexibility and the various abstraction that can compose. Now, dialects and MLIR is not a silver bullet. Assembling a toolchain with the capability of something like XLA for a heterogeneous system in a particular domain is still intrinsically a lot of work. But just like the availability of libraries like Boost are not making software development trivial either, they are just making it possible. So in this section, I'd like to talk about this compiler IR abstraction and develop this narrative that would surface the value there is to have all this composable abstraction in MLIR. So the first abstraction, and I'm not gonna repeat too much here, is the one I already showed before, is the affine dialect. It opens the door to polyhedral optimization. And this can be a very powerful tool to have at hand when your problem can fit the framework. So this abstraction has already been leveraged and adopted. For example, at Intel, we presented their early experience with MLIR and the affine dialect during the last compiler for machine learning workshop. The affine dialect and the entry path to LLVM can boost not only the development of such tools, but also compiler research in this domain, enabling more reuse and collaboration. Another example of compiler abstraction is what has been demonstrated by the TACO compiler, and in particular, the domain of Cogen for sparse linear algebra. TACO is a fantastic standalone tool, but it is likely not straightforward to integrate and reuse inside your project. If we were to add support for sparse score generation to a project like XLA, using TACO would probably be through a rigid interface that would not compose well within XLA. Uh, it's very likely that these hurdles will lead to a re-implementation of custom solution from scratch. And so luckily here, my colleague Art is currently bringing TACO's IDs into MLIR. That means that our ecosystem is growing with two different abstractions for polyhedral cogen and for sparse cogen in an infrastructure intended for making them compose together in the same project and be reusable. So we mentioned before that HPC is nowadays frequently heterogeneous. In particular, GPUs are ubiquitous. So if I start a DSL compiler to support some HPC user, I want to have solid abstractions to target accelerators. So MLAR has already entry the capability to represent a unified view of, the, of a program across the host and the accelerator. For example, here you have a GPU launch operation uh, that is here that delimits a region, those operation here, that will execute on the accelerator. And the code on the GPU here can call other functions that will be here and that are GPU functions. And so we can make use, as you see, we can compose dialects inside this GPU code. We can have operation that are in the LLVM dialect. And that's fine as long as we use LLVM for cogen for um, the code that is uh, executing on the GPU. The next step, and that's also already implemented in MLIR, is to split the host part from the device part. And so you can see that now we have uh, the host module, and this is host code here. And we have another module that is the GPU module that is encapsulated inside the host module. And now the GPU launch function from the host can reference the 
the function that is defined inside the GPU module. And the GPU module here, inside its region, encapsulates all the code running on the, on the accelerator. And we already have in tree the capability to jit this into uh, the GPU module will generate PTX, and the host will then embed the PTX, uh, jet it on CPU, and invoke, um, invoke it, and it's going to invoke CUDA as, as needed. So this is already pretty cool. Uh, we also have uh, support for SPRV, Intree. Uh, I invite you to watch the talk I'm uh, referencing here if you want more details on this. But we can round trip SPRV modules. We can target SPRV and Vulkan, again, um, providing uh, abstractions that can lower to various targets. Um, I'm running late on time, so I'm going to skip this section, but we have a nice application of MLIR uh, to MLIR. And so this is a, a pretty cool meta-level IR. Um, the idea is to model um, instruction selections or other problems where you have to transform the IR into its own IR itself. And so you can optimize a finite state machine that is intended to modify the IR, reuse your CSE or dead code elimination to optimize the way your uh, finite state machine is going to operate on the IR to match it and transform it. So this is again a pretty cool project and I provide some link in the slides if you want to know more about it. Um, one more example, it's MLIR for hardware design. This is a very recent project that is uh, in, M in LLVM as an incubator. Um, and you can see again how we can reuse compiler abstractions here uh, the MLIR logo are uh, external to this project and they are intended to compose fairly well. And all those dark um, box are actually dialects that model some abstraction used by, uh, by uh, hardware design. And this is a poster for the, from the most recent uh, LVM uh, dev meeting. Another example is around uh, runtime abstraction. And Erie is the perfect example of leveraging the ecosystem and integrate their ideas into it. They built a low level runtime starting from the principle that drives the Vulkan API and built multiple levels of abstraction above this, all in MLIR. So in this picture that represents Erie, most abstractions have a matching dialect. So the flow here um, is already the high level separation of the runtime construct. Uh, the how is their hardware abstraction layer, and this is a dialect, I believe. Uh, VMLA is another of their dialects. Those are dialects that are provided by MLIR entry. So this is the linear algebra dialect and that abstracts the path to CPU or to GPUs for Erie. And so this is again a very innovative and very uh, nice assemb assembla um, um, yeah, assembling of those, uh, those abstractions. Another example is um, the startup Node. Uh, which maps some machine learning workload on a distributed runtime. And their compiler stack on the right introduces a dialect on every level of abstraction. As such, they raise the abstraction exposed by the Legion runtime here into a dialect that they can expose to the compiler and reason about. All right. Um, Again, I'm running late, so I'm going to skip uh, the TensorFlow side, but we can model TensorFlow graph into a TensorFlow IR, and we did so in MLIR. It's already used in product, for instance, to target TF Lite uh, that's used. We have, uh, this is getting closer to HPC users, and this is a use of MLIR in, for implementing a DSL, uh, a DSL for modeling uh, a climate. And um, this is to solve uh, PDE, um, and this is intended to be mapped to multi-GPU machines. And so this is a presentation from last year. The you can click on the title and see all the details. And the value proposal of the MLI ecosystem is very clear. Again, you can reuse Affine, you can reuse GPU. And so you can map your own DSL to GPUs by reusing as much of the infrastructure as possible. And so that's a sample of the stencil dialect that matches the the DSL that they implemented, and it can be progressively lowered uh, to lower level abstraction and refined depending on the system targeted. Okay, Comet is another recent example. This publication is from last month at LCPC 2020. Uh, this is a DSL for computational chemistry. It fits nicely again in the framework on the ecosystem. And as the capability of MLIR increases, um, it's, it's going to be easy for 
the author of comets to benefit from the improved optimization, a support for multi-GPU or any other need they may have because they nicely layered it on top of MLIR and reusing as much abstraction as possible. So this is showing on the left the Comet DSL uh, and before it, uh, it gets lower to MLIR and on the right, the actual matching dialects uh, that models closely the DSL and that will slowly and progressively be lowered to more uh, abstraction. All right, I think I'm getting into my last example. Uh, this is getting into the heart of HPC now with Flang, the LLVM Fortran compiler. And so the design of the Flang IR, FEAR, is based on MLIR. And this follow a design similar to Rust or Swift. Um, so the dialect may look like this, just like for the previous DSL, it's intended to capture the Fortran specific semantic and enable accurate analysis and transformations. The kind of things that are easier to recover with the language semantic than when you end up at the LLVM level can be de-virtualization. By representing virtual tables and virtual calls as first-class concept, you can leverage the guarantees of the language to de-virtualize de function call um, in some cases. And so finally on this topic, during the keynote of LCPC last month, Jeffrey Vedder from Oak Ridge National Lab captured the picture accurately for Flank. And you can really see how the components from MLIR, which appear below this dotted line here, um, can be reused inside Flank to provide features like OpenMP, OpenSCC, uh, abstractions to target uh, possibly GPUs here. You have a path from OpenSCC to the GPU dialect from MLIR that I showed you before, and that can target CUDA or uh, Vulkan or AMD uh, abstractions then going back to LLVM. And so this really starts to build a picture. And I think something that we can go beyond that is think about how DSL author in an HPC context can design their language and tool uh, to take into account the MLA abstraction exposed by Flung and integrate their DSL closer with Fortran library instead of going down to C-like uh, FFI, which is fairly rigid. All right, this concludes uh, this uh, section and this overview is now highly time to wrap up. Um, and so with the benefit of hindsights of the last two years of development of MLIR, here are some takeaways. So the impedance mismatch between LLVM IR and programmers gave rise to many systems and countless rewrites of similar infrastructure with various qualities. And so MLIR breaks away with the one size fits all approach that LLVM IR pushed forward for compilers targeting CPUs. Our experience with MLIR is that it makes compiler development more agile, more iterative, but also more importantly, it involves a lot of fun. And so finally, my own goal today was to advocate for the ecosystem aspect. And so I tried to draw an analogy with the reuse and composability we get from software libraries with the dialect abstractions that MLIR provides. The LLVM community can grow and continue to be the place to collaborate on defining these abstractions. And possibly this decade, we will bring to HPC users the same level of usability and productivity that ML practitioners already enjoy. MLIR and the associated ecosystem has the potential to also impact compiler research, reducing the startup cost for new projects, making it easier to experiment with new ideas and maximizing reuse of existing flow. Finally, reducing also the path from research to production. I'd like to point out uh, to cl as closing remarks that we have a weekly open meeting um, with tech talks that are recorded and published on the MLI website. You are free to come and give a talk on your pet project or your exper experiments with uh, MLIR. Um, the community is mainly on the LLVM discourse forums. And if you prefer live chat, we are on Discord. And finally, we publish a bi-weekly newsletter to stay tuned into the latest developments. Thank you for attending and I'm gonna take your question now.